Welcome to Ascend, a podcast where I talk to interesting people building solutions in the cloud. In this episode, I catch up with my old friend, Alex Blecky, a senior manager at Deloitte Canada. We talk about his journey to the cloud, past reInvent conferences, tooling, and getting buy-in. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know we've, uh, we've had fun getting this scheduled, so thanks for uh, joining me today. I appreciate it. First question that. out of the bank or out of the gate is... How, tell me a little bit how you transitioned from what were you doing, what I'll call pre-cloud to kind of getting started your first gig and kind of how did you make that transition? Uh, well, uh, so appreciate you having me. Uh, it was uh, a number of steps in my in my professional journey that brought me to cloud. And uh, so um, actually out of school, I worked for Nortel for a couple of years in a sales operations role. Um, and, uh, you know, really started to understand kind of the, the consultative sale and, um, came back to, uh, to, to Canada and actually started selling cost per copy, uh, copier contracts. And, um, what I didn't understand, what I didn't realize at the time is I was actually getting an undergraduate degree in the whole CapEx, OpEx discussion where I was buying out traditional copier leases and, you know, selling managed services around the way people were producing documents. Um, I uh, spent a couple of years at a company called EchoWorks, um, where I got to understand uh, encryption, information security, and, and the software stack. And, and then, um, you know, had the luck of being part of the team that started a company called Trinimbus, where you and I met. And yeah. so, um, you know, Trinimbus was uh, born out of Optimus uh, information where we're kind of a DevOps first uh, stack down um, AWS partner, kind of grew into the first premier partner in Canada. And really, I mean, I'll be honest, I came to my first meeting with notes on how expensive S3 storage was. Like I had no idea what I was selling. And, uh, and, and so really, I was really lucky to, to, to be a part of uh, a really a really smart team at, at Trinimbus and, um, and, 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 and brought a lot of success to a lot of the unicorns in Canada. Yeah. And so it was pre pre data residency. And, yeah. uh, and so it was, uh, it was a different sale back then. Yeah, I can imagine. Eh? So interesting, you know, your, your journey seems very similar to some of the other folks that we talked about, right? Doing something completely different. Uh, and for one reason or another, I think if most people, you know, I'll put words in, in all those folks' mouths, a lot of us just kind of fall into these jobs at some point, right? Luck, you just happen to be in the right spot at the right time. And you, I smiled as you said, you went to that first meeting with how expensive S3 storage was. So let's talk a little bit about how did you kind of ramp up your skills? What what did you do early days to kind of start figuring out what AWS was? I know it's a much bigger beast now, mm -hmm. but tell me a little bit about kind of how you got started there and, and started navigating through it. Um, I mean, it was, uh, I found like like YouTube and the trove of, of online customer cases, I think was, 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 was a great education for me. Yeah. Um, being around the development community. So uh, one of my directives at uh, Trinimbus was to start the AWS user group uh, meetups where you and I met. Yeah. We, we did those across Canada for, you know, every four to six weeks in a different uh, locale, we'd, we'd get together and, and, and share stories. And so it was really, um, you know, uh, uh, it was really networking and, and, and reading and really diving into the content. And I think what was interesting is, you know, my formative years around data center and cloud was, you know, my first reInvent conference, they announced S4 HANA support, right? And everyone's, you know, wow, right? And, you know, I think I, I have pictures from our first reInvent conference where I think we were sharing the Sands Casino with a, a dental conference, right? So, <laughs> you know, how times have changed, yeah. but, you know, as, as I try to stay on top of all of the announcements and I think now there's nine and a half a day, yeah. um, you know, I try to stitch together the story because, you know, it's, it's, you know, half or three quarters or, or, or nine tenths of the journey is the tooling that Amazon gives us. But, you know, I think that wedge of where, where, you know, what keeps the light on for consultancies like uh, yourself and I is, 
you know, that, that magic of integration or, you know, bringing it to, you know, cloud native or, you know, adopting that new service that's going to, you know, spark that new revenue stream. Yeah. So let's let's go back to the the number of announcements because I had uh, Scott Ivory on uh, probably a couple episodes ago now, and and he asked me a question about how do I keep up with the announcements, and I I kind of I can't even remember what I said now. Uh, I think it reflects on kind of how I spend my free time is reading announcements, but I, I'm interested to to know how do you manage to to stay current. Yeah, it's 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 impossible. And I know that it used to be a singular RSS feed and you know that has quickly forked out into, you know, a number of different subcategories. Um I stay up to date by by keeping actually keeping my ear to the ground with what myself and what my competitors are doing, right? And what the marketplace are doing because um, I can only stay on top of, you know, the latest and greatest so much. Uh, I really need to, you know, you really need to focus on what's battle tested and, you know, at least ready for a POC. Mm -hmm. um, you and I have joked in the halls of many conferences and, you know, there'll be some, you know, extraordinary announcement that Amazon's made. And, you know, we joke that there's a job posting asking for, you know, five years of, <laughs> you know, development and run experience on this tool that's, you know, literally just gone to pre, pre, pre prod. Yeah. It's not even, in, not even GA yet. No, not even GA. Yeah. Yeah. Private beta. Yeah. That's funny. I, I kind of, I think I generally take the same strategy now. It used to be rel I, I, I don't want to say easy to keep up because I don't think it was ever easy to keep up. But one of the things that I do now is I tend to just very quickly scroll through the news and I know what our customers are asking us about. I know what we're maybe working on or, or almost going to work on with a customer. And to be honest, I'm looking for product names and things like that. Right. Um, and then, you know, they just mentioned, is it called Lookout now? Which kind of is near and dear to my heart because of my background. So if I see something that I find interesting, I just drag it into the read later file. But I, I try to just kind of filter now because you're, you're spot on. There's no possible way that you can keep up to this anymore. I know we, we used to madly sit at reInvent conferences and type notes during the keynotes about all the the new product releases and things that were coming. And even doing that now is challenging. I know there's some folks I follow on Twitter that do a really great job at it. And I'm always amazed at how they manage to do that live during a conference. So it's, it's hard, it's really hard. Some of the visualizations are actually pretty incredible. I think it's uh, there's some AWS uh, services out there that uh, they've, they've been able to visualize that make it a lot easier for you know maybe people that aren't as technical like myself mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good that's a good point. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, some hurdles that you ran into. So I, I kind of I heard you kind of you know I'm going to put words in your mouth here and you tell me if I'm wrong, but you almost my sense is you almost just learned from osmosis. You were just, you just dove into the community so much. You're having so many conversations, just through having those conversations, you kind of picked up things and, and started seeing how other people were building. Um, you mentioned reference architectures. Is that the architecture center you're talking about in AWS? Yeah. And then also, you know, people like Stephen Orban, right. Mm -hmm. And and his book, you know, it's effectively just a, a collection of case studies to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, uh, I didn't take a coding pla class past grade 10 HTML. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I tinkered my whole life. I've built PCs and, you know, but, but, but really, I mean, I, I, I don't have that computer science background. And so I've always thought of myself as more of a evangelist technical evangelist, more of an advisory kind of, I'm going to, I'm going to get in the weeds quick. <clears throat> and we're talking about announcements. Like you talk about the data announcements that Amazon's got and I can't keep up. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, I think if you talk to people that are, uh, exceptionally passionate about, you know, data specifically, like, you know, it doesn't take long to, uh, to challenge. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's you, you, you're spot on. It just it, it's it can be overwhelming, or it is overwhelming. Um, so grade twelve or grade ten was your last programming course. I was kind of in the same boat um, back in the day. I think they were they were Unisys machines, 
Uh, that's what I learned on in, in high school. And I think we had more fun tormenting our poor uh, teacher about the network and stuff like that than actually doing what we were supposed to do. That was the last time I actually took any formal training in, in computers as well. So we were cut from, it seems to me, this very similar paths that we've taken. Yeah. So learning through osmosis and things like that, what were some of the hurdles that you ran into during that? I'm always interested in kind of what what threw you for a loop and how did you kind of deal with it? Any examples you can share? Well, I mean, I think, I think, you know, it, it's a technical sale and, and, you know, especially, you know, developers and, and, and builders in general want to talk to people that can challenge them. Right. And I think uh, I, I learned very quickly that uh, I'm only as good as the team behind me. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, it's important to also, uh, sharpen your craft and and be a you know trusted salesperson that can also answer some difficult questions on their own right so you know I did take it up upon myself to get some basic certifications um, and 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 be able to answer answer some you know more technical questions so I'm not coming to meetings with you know the pricing sheet for uh, s3 storage yeah um, uh, I, I think you know the other the other uh, point I'll call out is, um, you know, leveraging um, the AWS community as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, the Canadian market being uh, slower to adopt than, you know, our U.S. counterparts. I think, you know, we had the luxury of being able to benefit from uh, a, a more mature community and, and ecosystem in the U.S. And I think, you know, we were very active in the community before the launch of the the, the Canadian region for uh, for Amazon, and so um, you know I believe you and I were both in the room for that day. Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting, um, and and what what I needed to learn very quickly uh, from that day forward was, you know, regulated industry, large enterprise. You know, now that data residency is satisfied, you know, there's a whole other lens to you know the cloud adoption uh discussion and it's not just you know it's not just development focused uh you know there's an interesting information security lens that uh that we quickly needed to bring to our discussions yeah i, I definitely think the the sales motion changed pretty dramatically uh at that day when when aws was in a hotel in toronto wasn't it i mm -hmm. uh, went to that little that little uh event they had when they announced the region because i know before that we used to run into the data residency thing all the time. And it, w it was, I think, uh, a pretty easy way to stop a discussion. Oh, we can't do that because our data has to be here. Amazon doesn't have a region. Uh, and then I know that the sales activities changed quite dramatically. Did, would you agree that kind of once that region opened, the way that you approached opportunities, talked to customers also kind of changed quite a bit? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I mean, once that fire was put out, because I mean, uh, you and you know, and I know that you know. I could call you with a Canadian cell phone uh, to your Canadian cell phone, and you can't certify that you know it didn't bounce off somewhere in the U.S. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you allow your employees to leverage, you know, a lot of hosted email services or you know, search online, you know, these things are all being um, these things are all being um, are all flowing to the U.S. So. You know, it, it was a tick box, but it was a necessary investment. Um, and I think that, you know, when you look at what Amazon, what, what the other cloud providers bring when they launch a region in a country, you know, it's not just, you know, an edge location. It's, you know, resiliency. It's multiple nines. It's, you know, um, it's an investment in the community and a number of jobs. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think uh, it, it's... You know, a necessary checkbox for, you know, financial services for public sector to, you know, really start adopting uh, what they have to offer. Yeah. So now if we could get the second region on the other coast, that would check another box, right? And That's maybe right. maybe stop some other really quick, easy blockers. So um, let's talk about continuing with that. That Actually, before I talk about hurdles again, I, I, you, you said about the Canadian market kind of being behind the U.S., and, and I agree, What when you think about how far behind are we, like I, I often think of a number in, in the number of kind of months, 
Uh, how far behind do you think we are as far as like, and by behind, I mean really just adoption of services, not necessarily them being available, let's say in the Canadian region, but customers actually investigating and, and spending the time to learn about them. How far behind do you think a Canadian organization typically is? I'd say we're three to five years behind, yeah. right? Like yeah. 36 to, yeah. to 60 months. And I think it's, you know, it's a number of things outside of, you know, traditional buying cycles. Um, but, but I think that, you know, you touched on a point, I think that we're now hitting, um, we're hitting the edges of, of cloud adoption where the services available in country are dictating, you know, the types of workloads that can go up, right? Because yeah. Now, you know, there's, there's, there's some pretty important crown jewel workloads that are certified for cloud around, around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it's CPU availability or redundancy, um, you know, there's, there are limitations to, you know, doing that kind of stuff in, in Canada. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to answer your previous question, I don't know if we'll ever see a second region, um, but, you know, I think uh, a well-architected infrastructure, multi-region, multi-AZ, you know, always seems to do the trick. Yeah, yeah, it, it definitely removes a lot of blockers, right? If you're able to at least, whether that organization ever adopts a multi-region deployment, because I always only half joke with people when I talk to them, a multi-region deployment guarantees you of two things, increasing the cost and increasing the complexity. Uh, and when you when you really get down to it, when you start looking at the cost, a lot of times people may say, okay, well, do we really need multi-region as long as we can uh, spread this over multiple availability zones? Are we okay? So yeah, it is interesting, but it, it might just kind of grease the wheels again a little more and, and remove some potential blockers there. Uh, it's interesting that you say about the, the service availability, because I know that we've got a number of customers that have products like on their radar. They're like, we really want to use X uh, and it's not here yet. So I know they they pretty pretty um, regularly watch for the announcements as well, and and just waiting for services to be released because of data sovereignty. You know, mm. rightly you know understanding it to your earlier comment about data flowing actually across the border or not, uh, but it makes people feel more comfortable that those services are available here. Plus, you might have that cost of data transfer between a region, maybe even that that could be challenging. Right. Yeah. And I think actually something that's interesting that I think we've both seen in our in our history and working with Amazon is um, the feedback loop of, of customer feedback and actually seeing, you know, announcements or, um, you know, iterations or advancements in a tool that your customer has been asking for from some time. And, you know, there's a Brett somewhere else in another country that's been asking for the same. And now it's in, you know, yeah, it's in reality. So, yeah. They, 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 um, yeah. they definitely listen to customer feedback, right? When it comes to roadmap and, and it's always been kind of one of my favorite things is that they're not just picking things out of the, out of the sky and say, hey, hey, this would be cool. They are really listening to customer feedback and, and releasing or developing services based on, on the feedback. Yeah, or using it themselves, right? Which... Yeah, yeah. I bet you most of the services are all used internally and then they become become customer available. Um, yeah, yeah. Let, let's talk again about hurdles then. So we've talked about your own personal hurdles and kind of how you, you dealt with those. Let's talk about just, you know, nothing specific, but what are you seeing for, for challenges within organizations that you're working with? Uh, what do they typically run into, uh, when, when they're either adopting cloud or they're already there and maybe they're doing something new? Tell me, tell me a little bit about what you commonly see there. Um, I mean, I think, I think information security and, and risk advisory is a major hurdle yeah. uh, in the cloud adoption journey. I think that uh, the cloud providers have um, done a great job and, and, and the security vendors have done a great job at kind of embracing each other and, and making that, that an easier story to bring together. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that, you know, it, the, the, the tooling and, and, you know, the expertise in, in integrating those tools is, is, you know, a made a big piece of the battle, but um, you know it's it's set it, it like a broken record. It always comes down to you know the people, the processes, and the team alignment, right? And and how that tool is going to make jobs easier, and who's going to be using it, and you know is there accountability? Because 
Um, you know, I, I've seen some fantastic technology be, being adopted uh, in my history, and, and it hasn't been, you know, been leveraged to its full extent. And, and ultimately, the project's been a failure. So I think uh, I think there's a lot of value in, you know, helping customers crawl, walk, run. And, and, and I think, um, you know, as with any POC or engagement, you know, having, having firm KPIs that you can, you know, point back to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So as much as things change, they, they really don't, right. It's, it's still the technology is the easy part. It's the people, it's the process, it's the adoption of the technologies that really are the, the challenging piece here. Uh, and buy-in across the business, right? Like security is just an example. Yeah. You know, the networking person's on vacation for two weeks and, you know, all of a sudden we're trying to deploy things in our new cloud landing zone and, you know, they haven't approved what we're what we're using, right? Yeah. And, you know, ultimately for a business to transform, you need buy-in across, you know, all facets. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen it <clears throat> um, for for cloud to be truly transformational. Um, you know, you do need, you, you know, you need uh, all areas of, of, of the business to uh, be able to accept, you know, on, on what terms, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, you said POCs and, and it's one of the things that we often run into when we're talking to customers and, and you know, a POC is a great way to test a technology, uh, help get buy-in. But one of the challenges that we often run into is uh, for a POC to be successful, it has to be something that has enough weight within the organization. Like enough people need to care about it. Uh, the people at the top of the pile need to be invested. Otherwise, you're not going to get the traction. And in, in even if that POC goes exactly the way that you'd hoped, uh, the, the lack of adoption inside the organization means that probably in the end, you're not really going to see the uptick that you would hope to see, you know, shifting more and more workloads over. So POCs are important, but they also take time in making sure that you get the right audience there. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you know, it's a good example. It's a good way to, to either fail fast or be iterative. Right. And, yeah. uh, but, but I agree, like you do need buy-in from the business on, you know, if, if we can hit these, if we can hit these metrics, um, let's, you know, let's really throw some data and, and, and really see what sort of uh, ROI we can get on, on what we're trying out here. Yeah. So security is, is a big hurdle, always been a, a challenge, right? Anything else that comes to mind that you, that you see, like when you're talking to organizations about where they're internally, uh, having challenges? I think tooling, tooling is mm -hmm. really difficult to, um, to wade through. Um, I think that, uh, you know, oftentimes organizations get caught up in, in a lot of the analyst reports. Um, I think that, you know, I, I've seen it time and time again where, you know, um, businesses aren't catering to their strengths, right? It may be the third best technology in that specific realm. Mm -hmm. um, but if that's what your team is, you know, particularly fantastic at, then you should kind of stick with it. Um, and, and I think, you know, especially with the bigger organizations and with, you know, with the new cloud story, I think, you know, you've got a lot of legacy logos that, you know, have consideration that new world, which kind of adds more, you know, credence to what I've just said, which requires, you know, you need to kind of look at as an organization where we made investments, um, you know, not just in licenses, but people. Um, and what does that look like in the future world, right? And, um, you know, what, what, what might be cannibalized by uh, a cloud native service, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what does our future state look like? Right? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, you know, you've invested all the time, the effort in a piece of software. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you don't necessarily just want to replace that piece of software because you can. Um, you know, all that time and effort, there's a, there's a value associated to that. So are you seeing, are you seeing organizations for lack of a better word, extend those tools into, into let's say, AWS as an example? Um, are you seeing people replace those tools just because they can, like they want something cloud native? Uh, kind of what are you seeing? I know that's an awfully wide yeah. open question, but generally what do you think people are trying to do? It, it's a measured discussion, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you, you can see, you know, uh, you know, as an example, load balancers, right? If you've got a massive team that are you know certified in a specific technology, and you could 
potentially license your farm of load balancers in Amazon and provide that team with the same, you know, console, you know, you should, you might as well cater to that strength. Um, but there are areas where, you know, I'm beginning to really see it where, you know, some of those legacy logos from the data center, you know, Amazon or the cloud, uh, the Amazon marketplace, just make it easier to, you know, do stuff. Right. And, yeah. and businesses are starting to make plans for the adoptions of those services because, you know, frankly, the agility is there, you know, um, the time to market is there. And, you know, I think the headaches around licensing, you know, for the most part, go away in, in the new world. Right? Yeah, the, the marketplace, it does a, a fantastic job at that. Just the licensing piece alone, just to be able to roll it right into your AWS bill, mm -hmm. still adopt the tools that maybe your team's familiar with, because change is scary, right? So to ask ask a team to take what they've done for a long time, shift it to the cloud, but also we're going to change the tool set, um, right. you know, that asking for multiple change opportunities in one shot is it's people that's scary to people so being able to take those tools with you and simplify the licensing i think is really important absolutely all right let's absolutely. see if we let's see if we can go to the well one more time any sure. i'm not searching for anything i'm not waiting for a specific answer one other thing that you maybe run into that you want to share that people should know about uh see the third one the, the skill is a skills gap Skills gap. It's I lied. Easy... I was searching for that. I figured you'd there say it go. at some point. Skills gap. Yeah. Skills gap. Keep yeah. learning. I, I deal with, you know, the smartest people that I deal with are always learning. Um, I joke, but I'm dead serious. Uh, an expert today that doesn't learn anything yeah. for a year is in trouble next year, right? So, yeah. like, you know, I, I think you need to continue to break stuff, continue to learn listen to new people, uh, you know, learn a new tool set. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always reading and always trying to keep up with, with what's next because, you know, you know, Amazon's one thing, right? We've got a whole host of platform and SaaS and other infrastructure providers that are out there that are, you know, constantly trying to stay competitive that, you know, have fantastic new offers that, um, our customers want us to be able to talk about, right? So yeah. um, I, I, I think that uh, certification is is important. Uh, I think experience is probably trumps that in my opinion. Yeah. As much, uh, as much importance as our industry puts on being certified, um, some of the very smartest people I've dealt with um, don't have time to take certification. And I know yeah. you have lots of them as well. Yeah. Yeah. They're too busy building stuff than worrying about the certs to, to demonstrate their skills. I, I think it's probably, you know, in the types of the organizations that we deal with, all the things that you said are, I think are spot on really common challenges The the, the upskilling of, of staff, I think is probably, again, Technology seems to be the easy part, right? It's the stuff around technology that is hard and, and having people, uh, giving people the opportunity to, to find the time to learn and go get certification so that they can validate those skills and stuff is, is really, really tough for organizations of all size, right? Small, right up to very large teams of people. It's the skills are hard. Um, and the other thing I'll say though is, is, is like, um, le legacy skills or skills in you know traditional technology when you can put a cloud hat on like i think amazon's hiring mainframe yeah. aws you know yeah. like that makes you a dangerous person right like yeah. you know it you, you're you are you know in the cloud world you are never you know um you're, you're never out of luck if you're willing to learn yeah right? yeah i think that's and a so, really good point sorry um, man finish your thought uh, I was just going to say, I think, I think it's an opportunity, you know, not just for mainframe people, but, you know, information security, you know, you look at what Google AdWords and Google marketing platform and now Amazon's doing ads, yeah. you know, there's, there's a whole marketing angle there, you know, there's esports, there's natural language processing. There's a lot of different kind of lenses to cloud um, that, you know, I don't, people don't need to reinvent themselves. They just need to kind of put on a different hat yeah. um, because at the end of the day, we're all builders, right? Yeah, that's exactly it. I think, again, man, spot on because 
I think sometimes I mentioned already change is scary. And I think a mm -hmm. lot of people that are just kind of, they're seeing cloud come into their organization. doesn't matter what provider it is. You know, some people may have the misconception that that means their job won't exist because, oh, we've got all these managed services and stuff. Uh, but you're, you're able to translate those skills onto whichever platform you're using. And to your point, if, if, you, if you take that builder mentality, a continuous learning approach, um, you can reinvent yourself over and over again here to do all sorts of really interesting and, and uh, I think challenging things that, that will keep you, keep you excited to do this type of work. It's, it's really interesting to see how people have kind of transformed themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've come across some issue with something and it's been, you know, someone from three jobs ago, 15 years ago, did some developer job in some old language that knows, you know, how to fix it. And, yeah. you know, it's a great testament to, you know, uh, you know, we got to, we got to kind of build on, on, on where we came from, you know, for me, it was, uh, photocopiers. I love these stories when I do this and, and you go back in time and you're like, okay, I'm interested to know how you got to where you photocopiers. That's fantastic, man. Um, that that's great. So let's, um, wrap up here with, you mentioned that you, you read a lot. I I'm all, I'm the same. I, I love reading when I'm not looking at a computer screen. So tell me kind of what you're reading right now. Doesn't have to be technology related kind of what, what, what's on the reading list. Uh, I just finished, uh, the data cloud by Frank Slootman, okay. who's the CEO of Snowflake. Yeah. Uh, and I've just started Sapiens. So oh, wow. that's my non-tech play i'm going deep so yeah yeah, yeah that's like yeah. that's like what that's a thick, thick one kinda, yeah, yeah I've got it. I've got it. yeah fit how about okay, yourself so, what are you reading what are you reading so i am um right now i am reading and i can't recall the name of the book but it's by scott galloway professor galloway it's about a, a post coronavirus sort of where he sees yeah. things going i am a little addicted to scott galloway right now i i listen to his podcasts and stuff i think he's He's entertaining. So I'm uh, dealing with that right now, kind of most of the way through that. I just downloaded uh, a technical book. It's, I think it's from O'Reilly. It's called Flow Architectures. Cool. And um, it's always just been something that's kind of, I found really interesting uh, coming from, you know, my background in systems management. We are always looking at kind of event streams and things like that before cloud existed. And we do a lot of event driven type stuff for customers right now. And, and I, a couple people that I follow on Twitter, uh, recommended it. So, uh, I grabbed that the other day and I've been, been working through that. So those are the two that are kind of on my list And my non-technical is, uh, the history of the Roman empire. And, uh, cool. yeah, that was like, it's been on my Kindle for a really long time. And it's kind of one of those things that's just always been interesting to me. So I go back to it and I keep kind of reading chunks of it and then get pulled back into work and then read another chunk of it. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's been a, on my reading list for a long time, but, uh, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, I, I, I have, have you heard, um, uh, Dan Carlin's hardcore history podcast? No, I haven't. Okay. You so should I, definitely okay. add that to your listening list. Uh, there's, you know, like a 10 part series on wrath of the cons. There's, there's a lot of good stuff there. Oh, okay. So let's, let's add one more. Okay. couple things before we wrap up yeah. physical or electronic books. Oh, I, I can only do physical physical. It's kind of like the PC versus Mac thing. So I always like to ask when we're talking about books and then I guess because you mentioned a podcast, uh, what's your favorite podcast right now? What are you listening to? I've been a Joe Rogan fan for a long time. Okay. Um, my, uh, someone has just gotten me onto scaling up, which is a very good one. Okay. I'm, and, I'm um, it. let me pull it up here. Um, I can't find who it's by. Okay. I can't find it right now. I'll, Sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it in Spotify later. I, um, I'm actually finding more and more podcasts that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it was one of those things that I kind of never really, 
understood, to be honest. I was kind of like, why, why wouldn't you just read a book? Uh, but I, I've really started kind of listening to them more and more. And there's lots of really fantastic content out there, uh, whether it's technical content or, you, you know, hardcore history. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to throw that one on my uh, on my list. And maybe next time I'm trying to get rid of the quarantine 15, I'll, I'll put that in the ears and see how it is. I, I've been listening to podcasts and working for a while. Yeah. The other thing that I found has helped is actually lo-fi music. Um, yeah. There's a couple of really good uh, channels on Spotify as well. Yeah, so I, I'm a f- huge fan of something called Pretzel. Um, okay. I know we're way off topic now, but this is it's always interesting to see what people are doing. Um, so we, whenever we're doing Twitch streaming and stuff like that, uh, Pretzel's always playing in the background. And, and I, I find now I'm even... Um, from your calendar, oh, hang on. Right Alexa, now, stop. There's, there's my go-to technology right now, reminding me of where I'm supposed to be. Um, sure. It's fantastic. So I was just saying that um, I'm even just pretzel. firing up yeah. pretzel now when I'm working and just finding, I think it's very similar. It's just find a channel and just let it play and uh, in the background as I'm working. So good, good tips, man. Well, um, thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Um, I know that we, you mentioned a couple times us bumping into each other in, in what I'll call real conferences, right? Where there's, you're actually mm-hmm. somewhere, which uh, I'm looking forward to. Hopefully this year we'll kind of maybe closer to the end of the year, it'll get straightened out that people start doing that stuff again. Um, and I know that uh, it's been great to con- reconnect here and at least virtually have a chat about some technology. So thanks very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you having me, Brett. Yeah. Uh, can't wait to uh to to more formally reconnect again yeah maybe the next reinvent will be a a real reinvent again and i bet you okay actually sorry i lied one more question you said what was your first reinvent how many people were there roughly do you remember it was less than a thousand i think it's amazing I, i don't know i think i think i think this last one was my my ninth maybe i had to miss one because i broke my leg um but that's yeah a, no, that's a yeah. story for the next time we have you back the missing reinvent because of a broken leg <laughs> at you least go. you didn't break your leg at reinvent there's probably even a crazier I, story there the casino had a had a wheelchair ready for me i just <laughs> i couldn't do it couldn't do it that's a long flight with a broken leg man yeah not comfortable at all thanks man stay safe i uh, really appreciate it and we will definitely uh reconnect in real life at some point here hopefully sooner rather than later Thanks, Brett. Keep in touch. Yeah, you too, man.